What does true faith look like? True faith. When we examine the various tenets of false religion, we realize quickly that there are examples, all kinds of examples, of false faith, of self-centered or conditional or boisterous, idolatrous, shallow. But what constitutes the kind of faith that the Lord desires to see? There are many places in Scripture where we find such noteworthy examples. With regard to faith, we oftentimes think of the numerous examples in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11 is oftentimes called the the hall of faith or the faith chapter. even defines faith as the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. Now, obviously we don't believe in blind faith, faith that has no object or no substance. That's nothing more than foolish well-wishing. No, true faith is a confident trust placed in the capable arms of another. And when it comes to Christianity, saving faith is putting all of your hope and all of your trust in the person of Jesus Christ. This is the kind of faith that Jesus is looking for when he encounters the sons of Israel. But oftentimes, he did not find it. However, as we turn in our copy of Scripture to Matthew chapter 15 this morning, we will actually see amazing faith coming through a very unlikely person. We note that Matthew 15, 21 really marks a a transitional point in the gospel narrative from Matthew 4, 12 all the way to Matthew 15, 20. That is the the period of Jesus' Galilean ministry. He's been ministering in the northern region of Galilee for this entire time. And he spends the most of his time in this, the northernmost region, close to where he's born and raised. And after a pinnacle series of events, which include the feeding of the 5,000, as well as the, the tense showdown between Jesus and the Pharisees, he looks to withdraw from the intensity of ministry for a short period of time. After that period of time, he's going to eventually travel south, where he's going to go and die. And so Matthew 15, 21 through 28 marks really a brief time stamp where Jesus has left Galilee seeking rest. But rest is hard to come by. Matthew 15, starting in verse 21. Jesus went away from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. And a Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and implored him, saying, Send her away, because she keeps shouting at us. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, O woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. Remarkable passage of Scripture. We'll talk about this this morning. Matthew 15 really seems to have a parallel account in Mark chapter 7. But here in Matthew, we read that Jesus went away from there, no doubt there referring to the overheated scene in the region of Capernaum, around Capernaum, and he withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. Mark 7.24 adds that upon arrival, Jesus had entered a house and wanted no one to know of it, and yet could not escape notice. So it's important for us to see that Jesus is not running away. He's not retreating. Rather, this is more like a brief sabbatical for ministry, a time of rest and refreshment before he makes one final surge before he goes to the cross. Now, remember, he's been ministering nonstop for two years. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, yeah, but I've been working for longer than two years without an extended break. What's the need for such a break? Well, it's important for us to remember the life of Jesus. He's been ministering to hundreds and sometimes thousands of people daily from sunup to sundown every single day without ceasing. 
And even when he's able to get away from the crowds, he still has all the disciples that are with him. And so now he's exhausted. And add to that whole thing, you also have the intense and increasing opposition and stress from the religious leaders of Israel. So day in and day out, he's in a high stress, tumultuous ministry every single day of this time. So he's tired. He's really tired. He's exhausted from this ministry. And so he decides, as a remedy, he decides to leave Israel. He actually leaves Israel altogether, and he ventures north into Gentile territory, the Bible says, to the district of Tyre and Sidon, which we believe is about 30 to 50 miles along, or north along the Mediterranean coast. Based on the events taking place in chapter 15, this excursion could have taken several months, actually. Uh, we read in chapter 14, verse 19, uh, that when Jesus feeds the 5,000, they're sitting down on the grass which would include or conclude that it's a spring or summer season. But when he returns, that same ground is bare in chapter 15, verse 35, indicating the winter months, again, we think. These are just clues from the text to tell us the time frame. So Jesus might have been gone for several months away from the, the busyness of life in Israel into the district of Tyre and Sidon, and he's eventually going to come back. But the the cities of Tyre and Sidon, it says the district surrounding those cities, so they could have been anywhere, but Tyre and Sidon, they were two key cities in Phoenicia, known for their advanced centers of culture and industry. These were hotbeds of the uh, pre-modern world. It was also, however, the place of infamous pagan idolatry and immorality and godlessness. This was well known, well known. Which is why Jesus' indictment to unbelieving Israel was so stinging in chapter 11, verse 22, when he says to the Jews who don't believe in him, it'll be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. See, Tyre and Sidon were the New Testament times equivalent to Sodom and Gomorrah. They were bad. They had a bad reputation, especially in Israel. They were, they were pockets of, of wickedness and terrible uh, endeavors here. But there were also places in this region that were very beautiful and even secluded. And so Jesus renders this to be a a good place for him and the disciples to get away and to find respite, at least for a little bit of time before they go back to Israel. But word soon begins to spread that Jesus is there. And in verse 22, Jesus and the disciples are visited by an unexpected person. Look at verse 22. And a Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. Now, somehow, this woman hears that Jesus is in their region and is able even further to track down his exact location in order to come to him. Remember back in Mark 7, it says that he went to this specific house and tried to hide. He didn't want anybody to know he was there. But she finds a way to get to him somehow we don't know. Matthew records that she's a Canaanite woman. A Canaanite. Now, Canaanite, that's an old term in the Bible. These are the early enemies of Israel uh, during the time of Joshua. Remember, the Canaanites are going to the land of Canaan before they're going to take over and turn it into the, the nation of Israel, the land of Israel. Canaanite is an old designation for this people. But Mark, interestingly enough, who's writing to his audience of Gentiles, refers to this woman as a Syrophoenician woman. That was a lot more contemporary to the times. So this woman is from the most likely the Syrian region of Phoenicia. So this is where she is. She's a Gentile, no less, from an extremely pagan culture. And yet, she's looking for Jesus. And when she finds him, Mark notes that she fell at his feet and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. Now, this cry is astonishing for several reasons. First of all, we want to note her posture of repentance here. How did she come to Jesus? Did she come bold and brassy? No, she comes really on her face. She falls down at his feet, but the first words out of her mouth are, Have mercy on me. Now, why would she say that? Well, on a most basic level, I mean, she's begging for Jesus to take pity on her and to heal her daughter. I mean, really, if you think about it, desperate people will say virtually anything to find a way out of their condition. 
And so, yes, on some level, she's probably just saying, take pity on me, help me, do whatever you can do for me. But I believe that there's a little bit more here. I really do. This cry for mercy is a common confession for those who know that they're sinners. And in fact, this have mercy on me, have mercy on me, that cry occurs 16 times in the gospel narrative, and it usually precedes some form of faith. See, saving faith is always accompanied by repentance. Lord, have mercy on me. It takes faith to have repentance. And vice versa, in repentance, that's when we start to see faith. So there are two sides of the same coin, repentance and faith. I'm reminded of the parable in Luke 18 of the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee famously stands in the temple and he is standing there proudly and he's boasting to the Lord about all of his, all his goodness and all the things he does for the Lord. And the tax collector is standing there as well, but he's barely there. He's a little ways off and he, can, he can't even lift his eyes to heaven. But he just stands there crying out and beating his chest, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And Jesus notes of this that it is actually the repentant tax collector, the sinner, who goes away justified by his faith. And so this Canaanite woman, no doubt aware of her fallen condition, she's unworthy of God's kindness. She falls down on her knees and she begs Jesus for mercy. So we see repentance here already laying the foundation. And then we see her reverence. Look at this. This Canaanite woman, this pagan from the region of Tyre and Sidon, calls Jesus Lord. Lord. Now we know that in these times, the word Lord, Kyrios in the Greek, is in many places a synonym for God, but it's also a a synonym for, or or a word to denote respect or a title of, it's like saying Sir. You could call somebody Sir, Lord. It's a title of respect. So we don't know if she's actually going as far to call him God, but she's certainly calling him Lord, Sir, respectfully. I want you to notice that she doesn't come to him with a chip on her shoulder entitled like so many people come to Jesus today. She doesn't go expecting and demanding a miracle from him. She lowers herself down and she calls him Lord with the utmost respect. And then she says something really amazing. I think it's very easy to gloss over these words when we read this account. But she calls him son of David. She's a Canaanite woman calling him Son of David. Now, Son of David is a Jewish messianic title. It refers specifically to the prophecy given in 2 Samuel chapter 7, where God promises David an heir who will sit on his throne forever. God says in verse 16 of the same chapter, Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. And so the promise here is that God is going to raise up a physical a physical descendant of King David who is going to reign an everlasting kingdom. So a physical descendant who is going to reign everlasting. How is this possible for this promise to come true? Because the only way to produce a physical descendant is through a human heir. And yet all people die, all men die. So how will this human reign forever? Enter Jesus of Nazareth, okay? Matthew 1.1 calls him the son of David, the son of Abraham. And we know biblically and theologically that Jesus is fully and truly human, which makes it possible for him to be the physical descendant of David, and he is. Read the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. It's connected. It's very clear. And note this in your Bible, even, there's no place where the Pharisees ever disagree with his genealogy. His genealogy is sound. They can't argue with that. So he is a physical descendant of David, yet Jesus is fully and truly God, which is why he's able to reign as Messiah and King forever. So that's the only way, Jesus, the hypostatic union, Jesus being truly God, truly man, that's the only way that the Davidic covenant is able to be fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. But understanding this concept of the son of David, that's a trigger phrase for this covenantal uh, instance That son of David phrase, that's distinctly Jewish theology. So here's the question that I have to ask. How does a pagan Gentile Canaanite woman, A, even know about the son of David, theologically, and B, know enough to identify Jesus as the son of David? That's a mystery to me. How in the world did she come up with that? But yet she does. 
She does. We have no idea where this came from. How does she know this? Maybe she had been secretly studying and kind of going against her own culture and studying the Bible. Maybe. Maybe somebody that she knows told her. Maybe there was a a Jewish person that she knows who said, well, your daughter is sick and we know the Messiah can heal. Who's the Messiah? Maybe she found out that way. We have no idea. But what's astounding here, and think about this with me, the Pharisees should have been the first to identify Jesus as the son of David. But instead, we have a Gentile woman from Tyre and Sidon, no less, who rightly proclaims Jesus as the Messiah. Marvel at that for a moment with me. That's remarkable. And what is she after? She tells Jesus, while on her knees, by the way, my daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. Now, she doesn't say how. We don't know how. But in other places in the Bible, we see demon possession results in things like screaming, insanity, vicious attacks on other people, self-harm, or even worse. So this is not a pleasant thing. Demon possession is awful. Mark 9.22 records a plea from a father whose son is demon-possessed. And he says that my son has a demon that would try to throw the boy into a fire and burn him or drown him in the sea. So this demon-afflicted person would be tossed back and forth, and it's a a terrible, vicious thing to go through. Awful affliction. Mark records that the woman kept on asking Jesus to cast the demon out of her daughter. Now, Jesus did this all the time. This is common in his ministry, casting out demons for countless people. Countless people. But how does Jesus respond to this woman? Verse 23. He did not answer her a word. He ignored her. And she kept on asking and pleading and begging over and over again. And if you look at the Greek verbiage here, the grammar of the Greek, it's persistent. It's continuous. She's asking and kept on asking. To the point where the disciples, it says, came and implored him, saying, send her away because she keeps shouting at us. Lord, we're on vacation. (laughs) And this woman, this Canaanite woman... Won't stop shouting and screaming. I mean, don't you hear her? Lord, send her away. It's so intense. The verb here that he uses is implore. They beg him. They plead with him. Lord, don't you see that she's suffering? I mean, you, you do this all the time in Galilee. Can you heal her, please? Lord, give her what she wants so she'll go. We're on vacation, right? Verse 24. But he answered and said... I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. What does this mean? It means that Jesus is a Jewish Messiah. In the Old Testament, God had promised His people repeatedly that He would come to them and He would save them. And when Jesus comes down, He goes to His own people. He goes to the Jews. That's what John chapter 1 says. He came to His own, the Jews, and yet His own did not receive Him. And Jesus goes to his own people upon his arrival. Furthermore, in in Matthew 10, 8, he tells the disciples as they're going out on their very first missionary journey, he tells them very specific instructions, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He doesn't say go to the Samaritans. He doesn't say go to the Gentiles. He says go to the, the, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Those who are of Israel who are lost and seeking the Messiah. Now what they didn't know that would come later on is that Jesus would extend salvation beyond the bounds of Israel. And we see this all throughout the book of Acts. We see this in Galatians. We see this in Romans. I mean, didn't Paul say that salvation goes to the Jew first and then also to the Greek or Gentile? And that was the big issue for the Jews in the first century. Is, Wait, what do you mean that salvation is going to the Gentiles as well? What do you mean that our Messiah is for them as well? That's the whole point. The wall of dividing line, the partition, the the things that were dividing Jew and Gentile, that's been broken down in Christ. And now there's one body together of faith, and that's rooted in the faith of Abraham. And so that's a a marvelous promise that comes to fruition. And it goes back to even the Abrahamic covenant, where God tells Abraham specifically, not just your people, but through you, all the nations will be blessed. Through you, Abraham, your kids, your generations, all the way down the line, your descendants will bless the entire world. But at this time, right now, 
In Jesus' economy right here, he's only focused first on reaching Israel. And he's actually, while he's away in Gentile territory, frankly, he has no obligation to do ministry at all. He knows his job. He knows what he's supposed to be doing. He knows his ministry. It is to Israel, to the Jews first. Verse 25. But she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Help me. Now she's desperate. She stopped giving reasons. She stopped making her case to him. She stopped asking for the specifics of her need. Now she's simply pleading for mercy. Lord, and I can almost imagine her on her knees grabbing the hem of his garment. Lord, please help me. Because who wouldn't beg, borrow, or steal for the sake of their suffering child, right? Wouldn't you do the same? Wouldn't you go to the ends of the earth and find anybody you could for help for your child? That's what she does. She's begging him. And so does he finally help her? I mean, she's on her knees, right? Doesn't he help her at this point? Look at verse 26. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. This is getting hard to bear, folks. I read these verses and I'll tell you, Inside, I'm like, what is going on? Because here, Jesus is use, he's using an analogy here of Jew versus Gentile. That's what he's doing. The Jews were regarded as the children of God, and he was their father. Okay, That's how the Bible has clearly laid it all out. These are the children of God, the children of Israel. However, the Jews of Jesus' day would oftentimes deride all non-Jews. I mean, they wouldn't cross the street to spit on a Gentile. They just wouldn't do it. Even one of these insults that they frequently used for Gentiles was dogs. Now, scholars have noted here that the word for dog that's used in this context is not the, the, referring to the wild dogs of the streets, but rather it's a domesticated house pet. But no matter how you slice it, you can't get around the fact that Jesus is calling this woman a dog. But even if we suspend our shock for just a minute, his analogies sound. His analogy is sound, because here it is. No parent would give preference to their house pet at the expense of their own child, right? I mean, you wouldn't feed the dog all of your food and then not have your kids eat dinner, right? That makes no sense at all. You wouldn't take your children's bread, Jesus says, and throw it to the dog. Ergo, the the ministry that he has, the miracles, the teaching, everything, was meant for the children of Israel. That was the, the focus, So why would he abandon that ministry and that focus for his attention on the Gentiles? He wouldn't feed the Gentiles and deal with them first before he dealt with his own children. He's still doing his ministry for his own children. Because Israel certainly would have been wounded by that. If he he comes to them after 1,000, 1,500 years and then says, you know what, I'm going to go north and leave them in their sin and death. That's not a fulfillment of promise at all. He must minister to the, to the Jews first. And yet, he still tells this poor, distraught, sobbing mother, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then he tells her after that, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. How does she respond to this? This, beloved, is remarkable. Look at verse 27. But she said, yes, Lord. Read that again. Yes, Lord. But even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Notice her posture here. She doesn't get offended. She doesn't fly into a fit of rage. She doesn't get up and say, how dare you? Who do you think you are calling me a dog? I came to you with a problem. Does she do that? No. She actually agrees with him. She agrees with him. Again, this woman knows that he's the son of David. And any person who knows he's the son of David knows that he's a Messiah for the Jews. Frankly, when it comes to Judaism, she has no business seeking any blessing from their Messiah. Because she's of the pagan people who normally despise the Lord. So she would have known this. Yeah, all my, all my people, Lord, 
They all hate you. They don't even think you're real. I believe in you, but I understand why you would reject me. So yes, I, I'm a dog. She like, he likens her to a dog, and she says, yes, Lord. She prostrates herself before the king of kings and concedes, I am a dog. And then she reasons this way. Follow this. But even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. She essentially admits, I have no right to come to you, Lord. But by your own word, will you still make provision for me? Will you still minister to me? Lord, will you still show mercy? Will you at least feed me with the crumbs of your ministry and the leftover scraps of your grace? Will you let anything fall from that table? I'll take anything. Anything. Beloved, this is the humble faith in action. This is remarkable faith. Because didn't Jesus say, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven? How does Jesus respond to this lowly, persistent, humbled faith? Look at verse 28. Oh, woman. Oh, woman. Your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. Notice he goes from dog to woman. Oh, woman. And notice the emotion here. This, this prefix, oh, He doesn't have to do this. This is recorded in 2,000 years of biblical history to record his emotion here. This isn't calloused. This isn't, oh, well, I guess I got something for you, lady. No, this is, oh, woman. I love your faith. That's what this is, beloved. Your faith is great. Whereas he rebuked Peter back in chapter 14, oh, you have little faith. Peter, what's wrong with you? Have you not been with me so long as still you have no faith? His own beloved Jewish disciples had little faith. And yet this Gentile dog has great faith. And he tells her, it shall be done for you as you wish. And then Matthew records her daughter was healed at once. And yet, beloved, I'm not going to lie. I'm still having a hard time understanding why Jesus would call a suffering woman a dog. Where does that come from? Why the switch? Does he really see her as a dog at that moment? I don't believe so. I don't believe so. What is he doing? What's going on here? Why would he wait so long and keep her in agony before healing her daughter? I want us to consider three things as we ponder this text. First of all, the Jews, mark this, the Jews regarded all Gentiles to be dogs. Partially because the Gentiles, they acted like animals. I mean, they really did. They were fervent in sexual immorality. They practiced idolatry. They were violent, nasty people, many of them. They even practiced child sacrifice. I mean, worshiping to Moloch and everything. I mean, they would, they would offer up their own children on the, on the altar as sacrifices. Terrible, detestable. And so, on one hand, Jesus is referring to her the way that she is commonly seen by the Jews in order to demonstrate to his Jewish disciples who were looking on that while the ultra-religious leaders of Israel, the Pharisees, the very Pharisees that they were worried about offending, those Pharisees had rejected the Messiah, yet in contrast, this dog from Tyre and Sidon readily confessed Jesus as the son of David and manifested great faith. He's setting up this stark contrast. The contrast between the the children of Israel and the dogs of Canaan is so great, it was an embarrassment to Israel. Do you see that? The dogs will confess me before my children do. It reminds me of Matthew 3, 9, when John the Baptist tells all the hypocrites that are coming to him, who claim to have Abraham as their father, oh, we've got Abraham as our father, and John says God is able to raise up children of Abraham from these stones. In other words, stones are more godly than you, dogs have greater faith than you. This is powerful, powerful language, meant to humiliate those who would not accept him 
from Israel. And so I believe that Jesus is playing into the stereotype in order to condemn unbelieving Israel. That's what I think he's doing. Because after all, for God so loved the world, that includes all the Canaanites and the Gentiles. That includes the, all the peoples of the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So yes, he's going to the Jews first, but make no mistake about it, the gospel is for all people, Jew and Gentile alike. So God has love for people, and Jesus has love for her. But then it gives us pause, because, well, why did he wait to heal the daughter? Because every minute that she's struggling with demon possession is, is like an eternity. But here's the thing, beloved. God's timing is not always our timing. In fact, I would even add, it rarely is. He never does things in the way that I would think he would do them. He often makes us wait on him for our own good and his glory. Doesn't the Bible say, wait on the Lord? Wait for the Lord? Those who wait on the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not become tired. They will walk and not become weary. Isn't that true? We're called to wait on the Lord. And so he makes us wait. Think with me. Jesus' slowness to respond gave her opportunity for the faith that she had to be displayed. If she just came in the very first second, he went healed, gone. The disciples never would have seen. He draws this out. Through the trial, through the trial, he draws it out so she has an opportunity to d- display this faith before all the disciples that were so worried about the Pharisees. You guys were so concerned about me making the Pharisees angry. Look at this faith. Peter, you pay attention. Look at this faith. The faith that leans into me. The faith that trusts me. The faith that professes without Reservation at all that I am the Lord, the son of David. He does this to put her faith on display. Beloved, just because Jesus doesn't answer you immediately doesn't mean he's not listening and doesn't mean he won't respond. We're told to wait on the Lord. That's a virtue that we don't oftentimes embrace today. We want it right now. Everything is immediate, isn't it? I mean, you're on a website, you click, if it, if it thinks at all, you get angry. <laughs> Remember back in the day with dial-up? Kids have no idea how good they have it. But think about it, we, we treat the Lord that way. As soon as the clock is ticking, we're like, come on! Lord, I pray, didn't you hear my prayer? But doesn't the Lord tell us to ask, and seek, and knock, and wait? I can't help but think of the story of the woman and the unrighteous judge in Luke 18. The woman persisted with him over and over until she got justice, until the unrighteous judge relented. And if the unrighteous judge will relent, how much more would the righteous judge of heaven who we are to seek persistently? And so don't stop asking. Don't stop prompting and praying. Don't stop Seeking the Lord and growing weary. Don't grow weary. The Lord hears and He will answer according to His will. Sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is just wait. And I will get to this when I want to. Does not God have plans for us? Does He not have works that He's provided and prepared before Him that we should walk in them? Is not God sovereign? Is not God good? We all nod our heads. Yes, that's true. So we need to act like it. Just because God does not answer when you want, doesn't mean He won't. There are times of great trial for us, aren't there? All of us go through trials. All of us. And I'll tell you, it is in the times of great trial that we are most grown. We don't grow as much when things are going well. When we're doing well, we go to church, we're happy. Oh yeah, great, wonderful. But I'll tell you, when the Lord wants to grow you in a season of time, He will put you into the wine press. And He will squeeze you lovingly until you are conformed to His image. God always uses trials. 
to test our faith, to test the metal of our faith. One more consideration. Many get offended at the thought that God would call anyone a dog or even refuse to help them immediately. But that's the problem with us, not with God. People say it all the time, and I hear this. I know you probably heard this before. I prayed to God. He didn't help me. I'm done with God. I, I went to church for years. Didn't do anything for me. They just told me I was in sin, and they did wrong to me. A pastor was mean to me. I prayed. I wasn't healed. I was poor. I didn't get rich. I'm done. And they walk away as if God owes you anything. He doesn't owe us anything, beloved. He owes us nothing. Jesus didn't owe this Canaanite woman a single thing. And she understood this and acted accordingly. She acted with repentance and humility and reverence and persistence and trust. And frankly, we would do well to follow her example. Because as soon as we forget that all of us are sinfully depraved and dead apart from Christ, then we're in trouble. Beloved, God owes us nothing but judgment for sin. He doesn't owe us anything. The fact that we're even breathing and alive right now is the common grace of God. How do we know? Because He wiped out the world once, save eight people. He even told Moses He was going to start over again, wipe them all out and start over again. Yet, we who are in Christ have received mercy. We don't get what we deserve. That would be justice. No, we get grace. We get mercy from God. That's salvation. That is the crux of the gospel. Grace. That you get blessing and kindness from God that you don't deserve. You didn't do anything to earn it. That's how the gospel comes to us. And yet, so many in this generation, and it seeps into every single generation, we are so entitled and embittered and arrogant. And we want to snap our fingers and command God to do what we want Him to do. Shame on us if we think that. God is not on trial here. We are. We are. And yet, and yet... Jesus Christ came and took our place at the cross. He came and He stood where we were supposed to stand. Nailed where we were supposed to be nailed. And died the sinner's death, even though He Himself was not sinful, could not be sinful. Yet He came as a substitute to pay for the sinfulness of men and women all around the world. He paid my sin debts, and if you know Him, if you've been forgiven by Him, He's paid yours as well. He died on the cross to pay for our sins, was judged and condemned by His own Father for us, and then rose again the third day to bring new life and reconciliation and forgiveness and life anew. He gave us a gift that we could never demand, never deserve, never earn. And so we are also worthy to be called dogs. And yet, God calls us His children. And He adopts us through His beloved Son. And seats us in the heavenly places in Christ. I mean, fathom this. That He would take such a sinful person, a life of debauchery and rebellion against Him, even if only internally, the sins of the heart. And He would wipe us clean and forgive us and seat us with Him. Oh, bless Him. Oh, what amazing grace. And oh, that we would be fed from the crumbs of Your table, O oh Lord, and yet You've given us a lavish banquet. Oh, rejoice with me, beloved. Rejoice with me that God is so gracious and so merciful and loves good faith. 
Let's go to him in praise and worship even now. Lord God, oh, we bless your name forever. That we are like this Canaanite woman. We are a people, as Isaiah says, of unclean lips that show that we are a people of unclean hearts. And Lord, I even think about where we are in this world right now, in this generation. We are seated amidst a a nation of wicked people doing wicked things. And so we would come to you and say, Lord, I know our people sin against you, but have mercy. But you, by your own word, have had mercy and will have mercy. And you redeem what is otherwise unredeemable. And you cleanse what is filthy. And you save what has been lost. Because you are an amazing God. And so, Lord, I pray earnestly, if there is a single person here who maybe they have never trusted in you, that maybe they look at their own life, they're sitting here examining their own life, their own thoughts, their own past, and they say, I, I've never received forgiveness. I've never received mercy from you, God. I pray that you would grant them repentance, that they would say, have mercy on me, Lord, Son of David, and that you would forgive them of their sins. And in so doing, they would look to the cross that they would put their faith and their hope in Jesus Christ and be forgiven and reborn and starting today would live a life of faith that would now surrender all to you and trust in you day by day, one step at a time, and follow after you as a son or a daughter, a child of God. O Lord, you are rich in mercy, abundant in loving kindness, And so, Lord, we have nothing to bring to you except our our humble pleas for mercy and our fiery hearts of love that adore you. God, your church here loves you. And so, Lord, let this faith be found true. We praise you now in Jesus' name. Amen.